Hello and welcome to the Indicator 13 Compliance Module 1 Agency and Student Invitation Participation Pretest. At this time, we're asking you to take the pretest either by clicking on the QR code or typing in the SurveyMonkey URL code. When you do that, please stop the video at this time and wait to start it until everyone is finished. Thank you. Welcome to the Indicator 13 Compliance Module Series. Module 1 focuses on agency and student invitation and participation. The purpose of the Indicator 13 Compliance Module Series is to enhance practices for writing compliant transition-based IEPs and to broaden the foundation for effective practices related to Indicator 13 of the State Performance Plan. Today's module, Module 1, focuses on agency invitation and participation and the student invitation to the IEP meeting. Remember that these topics are from the file review questions that occur in the Cyclical Monitoring for Continuous Improvement Audit when the, when the state auditors come in and monitor your district every six years. So the module today focuses on these two questions. This first part of module number one refers to file review question number 246. And this question is related to whether or not transition services that are likely to be provided or paid for by other agencies is documented within the IEP. And this would include any type of evidence that a representative from participating was invited to that IEP team meeting. The important point here is with prior consent of the parent or family member. When we look at the agency invitation to the IEP meeting, there are two criteria that are addressed. First is if the agency is likely to provide or pay for services for that transition age student. And the second criteria is that for all agencies that are invited, the parent must provide permission. Uh, Pennsylvania is one of a few states that uh, the age of majority does not happen until age 21. Therefore, that young person still has to have that family, that parent permission in order to engage with an outside agency. This slide goes through some additional criteria about inviting agencies to the IEP meeting. As we said before, an agency is invited if they are likely to provide or pay for transition services, but again, only if the parent provides permission. I think it's important to note that it is up to the school entity, whether it's the school district or the charter school, to inform the parent of the importance of engaging with an agency, what services and supports they can provide. But again, the parent must provide permission in order for that agency to be invited. Agency involvement is also based upon individual needs. You're not necessarily inviting every agency to an IEP meeting for all of the students that have IEPs that are ages 14 to 21. It really does depend on that student, that student's disability, as well as that student's post-school outcomes regarding going on for further training, employment, or living independently in the community. Agency involvement may be somewhat limited for younger students. Um, so for example, uh, with the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation, OVR, at age 14, um, they may be providing more of informational type of services or group types of information. As that student becomes older, as they're entering in their junior or senior year, they may be become more actively involved with OVR at that point. Agency involvement also does vary by region. Um, especially with the intellectual disability services and mental health services that are county-based throughout Pennsylvania. It's important to document agency involvement in the present ed level section of the IEP under secondary transition services. Um, so that's in, again, the present education section under secondary transition. And the way that we suggest doing that is by putting a bullet that says agency involvement underneath that section as a separate area to list what that agency involvement looks like for that IEP year for that student. This slide talks about some sample IEP statements that could be included in a student's IEP. 
The first example is that representatives from the agency were invited with parent permission. And in listing that, you would list the name of the agency, you would also list the dates that that occurred. The second example is looking at the parent's refusing to consent to inviting an outside agency. Again, it's important to indicate that the LEA, the school district or charter school, did attempt to invite an agency to attend the IEP meeting for this transition aid student. However, at this time, the parent refused um, to have that agency involved in the IEP meeting and to engage with that young person, that student, and their family. The last example um, is really looking at um, if an agency does not attend an IEP meeting. Um, so that although the agency did not participate in the IEP meeting, the parent and the student were provided with information regarding what services and supports that agency could provide. The other piece along with that is an agency representative may physically not be able to attend an IEP meeting, however they could provide information and that information would also be included in that section of the IEP. This slide um, shows an example of a possible agency involvement statement. So in this example, Bob and his family were provided with information regarding the supports provided through a provider agency. Um, in this sample, it was Allegheny River Intellectual Disability Ser Services and the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation, OVR. It goes on to explain in this statement that Bob met with a supports coordinator from the Allegheny River Intellectual Disability Services and it lists the date on May 3rd and now has a current open case. And then it goes on to talk about Bob's involvement with OVR um, and that both OVR and the Allegheny River Intellectual Disability Services would be invited to Bob's fall IEP meeting. This slide talks about some possible examples of agencies that could be involved with a student. As we said before, uh, not all agencies are invited to every student that has an IEP meeting that is of transition age, but this gives you an idea of some possible agencies that are or should be considered as uh, an invitee to an IEP meeting and also to engage in that transition planning process with a student and their family. These include the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation or OVR, county-based mental health system, your county-based um, intellectual disabilities office, um, referring or providing information regarding services provided through the Bureau of Autism, um, information about blindness and visual services, which is actually also um, a sister agency of OVR or the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation, um, and then other types of supports, uh, again, depending on the situation of that young person. So if they are involved with um, children, family, youth services, if they're involved in foster care, if they're involved in the juvenile justice system or the correction system. And then we also have listed some provider agencies such as AHEAD or the ARC, um, Centers for Independent Living throughout the state, um, a benefits counselor um, from one of the Workforce Innovation um, Opportunity Act, their, their provider agencies um, could provide information on benefit supports and they may also be considered um, an invitee to an IEP meeting. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Paula to talk a little bit about the student invitation. Thanks, Michael. So the second question related to this module is question 247. And it asks the question, is there evidence that the student was invited to the IEP meeting? And as we know, in the state of Pennsylvania, this has to happen for students ages 14 um, and older. Um, however, it doesn't limit us to that. If a student needs transition services who is younger than age 14, that can certainly be provided as well. So it's important to remember that the invitation must reflect that both the parents and the student are invited um, for all students ages 14 and older again. And what's important to remember is to ensure that the correct boxes are checked on the invitation. Um, letter and make sure to make sure that the students um, know that when they come to this meeting they're going to be talking about transition services and the actual invitation needs to be contained in the students permanent file because that's what's looked at whenever um, again the compliance monitors come in to make sure that this has occurred 
In June of 2015, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania removed the, the requirement to use two separate invitations to invite both the parents and the student. So we now in the state of Pennsylvania just have one invitation to the IEP meeting and that includes both students and parents. And this is what that invitation looks like. To, so to ensure that we know that both the student and the parents are invited to the IEP meeting, you need to not only check the boxes that relate to transition planning and services, but the student's name must be included in the bottom box next to student name. That ensures the compliance piece that the invitation has been sent to the student. Okay, so now we're going to take this a little bit beyond compliance um, with some questions. So, Michael, do we have to get parent permission to invite representatives from the outside agencies? Yes, you know, and as we had discussed before, you have to have parent permission in order to invite an outside agency to attend the IEP meeting. Um, and it's important that um, the parents are provided with some information, I think, ahead of time as far as why we're even considering inviting in that mm -hmm. agency. And does that, um, does that consent have to be in writing or can it be verbal? Uh, if it really, you have to have it documented. And so mm -hmm. if it's in the invitation letter and the parents respond and that is a documentation, you can also call the parent, but you need to document that the parent is giving consent okay. on that particular date um, and then save that documentation in the student's file. Okay, great. What if um, an organization, an agency like OVR is coming in and speaking to a group of students? Do we have to get parent consent um, for, for a group of students? Right. No, you do not. Okay. Um, if a, agency and outside agency is coming to a transition fair or coming and talking to the entire group of students, you don't need to have individual uh, parent permission. Uh, the individual parent permission comes in when that agency is coming in and talking to a particular student. Okay. Um, what does the district need to do if the parents refuse participation um, uh, if, to the student's IEP meeting? It's important that the district documents that the student has um, refuse to have that agency come to the IP meeting, um, document that in the IEP, uh, date it, um, state possibly the reasons why the student is refusing. I, I think probably prior to the next IEP year though, information should be provided to the family as to the importance of engaging that agency. But it is important to document it because if a LEA would wait, mm -hmm. uh, not have documentation, um, and the student gets ready to graduate, the family could come back and say, well, you never provided information regarding a given agency that could have helped my son or daughter. That, that's great advice. Um, thank you. What if no outside agencies are invited to the IEP meeting because either the student is too young or no agencies are needed at the, that particular time? You know, and as we discussed in the presentation piece of this module, um, there really should be information provided to the student and their family about the agency. While they physically may not be attending, um, you are still providing information about what services they can provide and, and making sure you're documenting that, that information was given to the family and the student about what services that agency okay. can do. And if the agency is invited but they can't attend, are they required to provide written input for the IEP meeting? I, I think it would be uh, beneficial that some information is given um, about that agency's involvement mm -hmm. from um, the agency representative to the school and then that information incorporated in the present ed levels um, as far as what that agency has been doing up to this point with that young person. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's again an effective practice uh, that that would be done but that way I think all the information is contained in one place and that, that helps for better transition planning. Great. So I understand that there's one transition now to invite both the student and the parent. Um, and if all the boxes are checked and, and it's sent to the, to the parents, um, I understand that that's what meets compliance. However, how can districts really ensure 
that the student understands that they are invited to this IEP meeting. Because I'm not convinced that just because we send an invitation to the parents with the box check that the student is invited to, that the, par that the parents are always communicating that to the student. So how, what can districts do to ensure that the student knows that their IEP meeting is coming up and they're invited to it? Right, and, and I think that um, that does take time for that mm -hmm. to occur uh, because I agree with you. I don't think just because the box is checked on the invitation letter the student is even going to know that they're invited. Um, oftentimes, I think students aren't really even aware what the IEP mm -hmm. is or what the IEP meeting is. Um, so I think in districts where this has been an effective process, um, they start months ahead of time mm -hmm. in talking with the student about um, you have this disability, these are the accommodations, these are your goals, this is the point of the mm -hmm. IEP mm -hmm. meeting, um, and then as it gets closer um, to really have that discussion with that student. Um, kind of set aside, talk about this is the purpose of the meeting, this is when it's coming up, um, you know, these are your IEP goals, um, getting input. Um, you know, recently talked to a young person, they said that was really important, that they were aware of what their IEP goals were and, and what progress they were making on them. So I think really taking the time and engaging that young person in that process is so crucial. If that occurs, then I think it's meaningful. Right. Um, and just one more time, can you remind everybody where those completed invitations are actually housed and stored? Right. Those should be um, contained in the student's permanent file. Mm -hmm. um, a copy definitely has to be there. I know districts may have them in other places, but it really does need to be in the student's permanent file. Perfect. Okay, thank you. So this concludes uh, Module 1 of our Indicator 13 Compliance Module Series. Should you have any re questions regarding the content, um, or any questions re regarding the series, please contact your IU or Patent Transition Consultant. You can find their contact information on the secondarytransition.org website um, under the directory information. And if you are a director or an IU or Patent Transition Consultant and are interested in receiving the results of the surveys, the pre and post test surveys, um, please contact transition modules at patentpittsburgh.net. But please know you're not completely finished with the module until you complete the post-test. So we are asking you to do this at this time. Thank you so much for your participation today.